pleasure to be here, and I thank uh, Professor Martin Goldman for inviting me every year, uh, which is uh, something uh, that we certainly appreciate. I pay him a little bit on the side, but anyway, <laughs> but we certainly appreciate uh, the ability and the, uh, the, this opportunity to return to Charleston. And, uh, to see how the community is developing and growing and how things are in general in Charleston. And it looks like uh, Charleston City and County is involved with a tremendous economic boom, which is uh, very interesting. And I hope the Jewish community also benefits from that. We would hope so. <coughs> <coughs> And I'm sorry if I cough a little bit. Uh, that's also because of Charleston pollen. Zero. So we're now at the peak of the season. So today it's a little cooler, so it's a little better. I thank you for coming. If you've heard me before throughout the weekend, it's very nice for you to come again. If you haven't heard from me throughout the weekend, I certainly thank you for coming now. So the topic of my discussion here is, uh, it has to do with a very famous woman, a very famous woman in Jewish history. Uh, this is Hannah, who was uh, the wife of uh, uh, Elkanah, Ben Yerocham, Ben Elihu, Ben Tofu, Ben Tzuf, Ephraim. Chana was also the, the mother of the prophet Shmuel, and she, she, and she also was uh, a prophetess in her own life. So we read on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, as part of the Haftarah, and we read from Shmuel Aleph, 1 Samuel, the first parish, first chapter, about uh, Chana and um, and her husband, and uh, we read also about her her tzara. Tzara means yeah, that's the wife, the second wife of the husband. In other words, in Hebrew, if a man is married to two women, that's tzara. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> that's what it is. Tzara. So, in fact, uh, we sometimes translate that as a rival. But again, that points out the fact that the Torah really and the Tanakh and Judaism in general uh, did not encourage polygamy or polygamy. It really encouraged monogamy. And every time we had a polygamous or polygamous situation, uh, we always had trouble. Always had trouble. And going back to Abraham and his wife Sarah and Hagar, there was trouble. And we have with Yaakov, he certainly had trouble. He wanted to marry Rachel, he was strict to marry Leah, and then he had other problems. And that caused a lot of sibling rivalry. So the Torah really does not encourage polygamy, but it did allow it. Why did it allow it? It allowed it to a certain extent among different Jewish communities. Uh, you had it uh, basically in biblical times. You do not have it too much in Talmudic times. We don't find any Talmudic rabbi who had more than one wife. But you, and Moshe Rabbeinu only had one wife, and uh, Aharon only had one wife. And we see that, that Yosef only had one wife, so that was the, the proper type of behavior we should adopt, monogamy. And it goes back to Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, according to Torah, there was, there was a 100% monogamous relationship, according to the text of the Torah. I'm not going to any of the outlandish Midrashim or other stories that were mentioned, but that is what it says in the text. Now, whenever you did have a polygamous <coughs> relationship, as I mentioned, you had trouble. <coughs> so why did the Torah allow it? 
because there were more women than men, as there are today. More women than men in most societies, for various reasons. <coughs> in those days, it was probably because of war, uh, and the young men were killed. So you had more women than men. And what is a single woman going to do in those societies? She could not be part of the normal employment as a shepherdess or a farmer. She couldn't compete against the men. And we did not want her to go into any immoral types of behavior. So the Torah allowed it so that at least the woman would have, have a shelter and food. And that's why they allowed it. This was uh, allowed by the Ashkenazi communities until uh, Rabbeinu Gershom Or Hagalah, who was uh, born in uh, about 1160, died in 1028, in Germany. He was first in France and Germany, and he issued decrees forbidding polygamous relationships. So you're talking about over a thousand years ago, it became forbidden. And all Ashkenazic Jewry. Jews of uh, Europe, Western, Northern Europe, all accepted. So today, for our Shalani Jews, it's, a, it's not possible. It was forbidden. Then uh, the Sephardic Jews, Jews who lived in Spain and Portugal, they did not accept that decree of Rabbi Gershom, but they did. They, they, uh, they put in the ketubah that the husband would not take another wife. That's how they put it in, in the Ketubah, the marriage contract. The Jews of the Muslim countries, <coughs> uh, they never accept it. I don't know until this day. It is possible to, to go to a Muslim country where there are Jews. There are very few Jews left in Muslim countries. And find a polygamous marriage. You will find it. Uh, when some of them immigrated to Israel, Israel said, well, if you come in with more than one wife, you can maintain that situation, as long as you can afford it. Uh, but uh, they would not allow it, under normal circumstances, to happen in Israel. So basically, in Israel, there's only monogamous relationships, even with Jews from the Muslim country. So here we see in this uh, <coughs> story of Kana. So this man, Elkanah, so he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. That's always a source of conflict. One had children, the other had no children. Right? So, and he used to go every year to go to Shiloh. Shiloh was the a city where the Mishkan, the Potomac Temple, was erected there, and that was the holy place of the Jewish people before Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not yet conquered. Jerusalem was still part of the Jebusites. They go well, the Jebusites and, and mosquito bites right everywhere. So the Jebusites, they controlled Jerusalem. So they did not. Uh, they did not have the Mishkan there, the Holy Tabernacle, but it was in Shiloh. So they used to go up to Shiloh, and uh, there they would offer sacrifices to God. Okay, and when they went up there, so um, Elkanah gave to Penina, his wife, and to his sons and her, her, her sons and daughters, gave portions of food and other things, other things of value. And to Chana, he gave one portion, but it was worth as much as all the others. <clears throat> so he, he, he loved Chana more, but Chana didn't, didn't have children. And so, if he asked to, and her rival, her Taurus, meaning Penina, aggravated her, made fun of her. I have children, you have no children. You're not a real woman, I'm a real woman. He aggravated her. She aggravated her. So, um, so, so I used to cry. She would cry. So she would cry. 
And uh, so Elkanah said to her, Why are you crying? Am I not better to you than ten? Than ten sons. Why are you crying? He, he didn't have the sensitivity. So, <coughs> so what happened then? So, so she got up one day after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk things. And she went up to the, to the Mishkan, the bottom of the temple. She actually went up into the Mishkan. And there in the Mishkan was sitting at the entrance, Elkanah, not Elkanah, but Eli. Eli was the high priest. Eli was sitting there. And so she comes in and she starts to pray to God. And we learn how to pray from her. That's why one of the reasons we read it on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. We learn how to pray from her. And she made a vow. And she, she wept when she prayed. And uh, she said if God would give her a child, and uh, that sh she would dedicate the child to God. And uh, she moved her lips, but no sound was heard. She moved her lips, but no sound was heard. So Ailey was watching her, the high priest. And uh, Ailey thought her that she was drunk. That she was inebriated. Now the rabbis say he consulted the Oribatumim, which was a special sort of line of prophecy on the breastplate where the names of the tribes of Israel and they Letters would light up if you would ask a question. So he asked the order of the what is the quality of this woman? And so the letters came. Kof, Shin, Reish, He. Now it's his job to arrange them in a the proper order. So Kof, Shin, Reish, He means Kishera. She's a proper woman. She's a good woman. He arrange the letters, Shin Kof Reishe, Shikora, she's drunk. So he gets angry at her. And he says to her, how long will you be drunk? Remove the, your wine from upon you. And Hana answered and she said, Lo Adoni, Lo my Lord, I am a very, very grief-stricken woman. I have drunk no wine or strong drink but I am pouring out my soul before God. Don't consider your maidservant to be one of the worthless people, because out of the, out of the sadness of my heart, I speak to you till now. So and then, Bayan Eli, and Eli answered and said, Lechi shalom, go in peace, and the God of Israel will give, will give you your request that you requested from him. Okay, now that is the part of the story that we're going to comment upon, the Gemara comments upon. So if you have the, the packet there, we have a few more to read them. So <coughs> I have it both in, in the, the Gemara's language, which is Hebrew and Aramaic, and I have it also in English. So if you want to use English, you can go straight to David. If you're in the, the Gemara language, it's right there uh, at the bottom of the page, four lines down in the middle. Four lines from the bottom, where it says, Oba Rab You see it? And if it's in, if you're on the English, you can go to the next page, and it's right over here at the bottom. So you can either follow in the Hebrew or the English. Now, uh, the, the, the Talmud I used was a basic Talmud. And the translation I used was Sunsida's translation. I did not use the Art School translation. Why did I use the Art School translation? One is bigger, it takes more base. Another reason is, 
Art school is very, uh, very careful. They don't want you to use anything because of copyright infringement. So therefore, the tuxedo, the copyright already lapsed, so I can use tuxedo. <laughs> anyway, here's what it says. Rav Habnuma said, how many most important laws can be learned from these verses relating to how? You see it? Okay, everybody have it? Oh, so now we learn laws from Chana. What Chana did? We have actual laws. So, now Chana, it says, she spoke in her heart. From this we learn that one who prays must direct his heart. From this, so first of all, I want to point out to you uh, about the high regard uh, that Judaism have always had for women in the very beginning. High regard, very high regard. Not only uh, in, in superficial things, but in things of the spirit, right? What did God say to Abraham? Whatever Sarah says to you, do. And we know a couple here who follow that all the time. <laughs> Whatever Sarah says to you, do. So we find in that moment, Sarah was a greater prophetess than Abram was a prophet. So here we're going to actually learn laws of prayer from Khan. So, so what does she say over here? So. From, her, from here we learn that one who prays must direct his heart. What does that mean? You must have kavana. You can't just say the words by rote. You must mean what the words say. You must think about what the words mean. And you have to then devote your, your heart and your mind and your attention to those words. She learned, she said it from her heart. From her heart. So that's a very important thing. And that's the halacha. The halacha is, the law is, how about if you, you daven and you don't, and you think about something else? That happens all the time, by the way, doesn't it? So have you fulfilled your requirement of prayer or haven't you fulfilled your requirement of prayer? Well, according to this legal discussion here, if you do not really have in mind what you are saying and meaning, you haven't fulfilled your obligation of prayer. And who do we learn that from? Khan. So that's a very important hello. Then we continue. He says, only her lips moved. From this we learn that he who prays must frame the words distinctly with his lips. It's not enough to cite me. Because when you sight read, it's, you can, your mind can wander. But if you actually pronounce the words silently to yourself, moving your lips, as she did, if you learn it directly from her, as she did, then we are fulfilling the, the uh, obligation of prayer. You know, her lips moved, but uh, her voice was not heard. But her voice could not be heard from this it is forbidden to raise one's voice in the tefillah. From here we have the silent Shimon Ezra. And when you're doing the silent Shimon Ezra, you're not supposed to do it real loud at all. You're supposed to just whisper and move your lips. Because you don't want to, in any way, interfere with your neighbor. Your neighbor's also trying to pray. So you don't want to scream out the words of the tefillah. Now, actually, uh, when we have uh, the Chazor Sashats, when the, the leader of the Dabri repeats, so he says it aloud. But uh, when you're doing it silently, you're supposed to do it silently. So we learned this from Khan. Her voice was not heard. So you're supposed to, that's why it's called the silent Amida, right? The silent Amida. Okay, the next is, therefore, Ailey thought she had been drunk, or she had been intoxicated. From this we learn that a drunken person is forbidden to say the tefillah. Right? That's a big halakha. 
In other words, you know, there used to be a group of people who said, well, if you got a little high on alcohol or on drugs, then you could get a closer relationship to God. No, we say the opposite. A person who's drunk cannot daven. A Kohen who is drunk cannot duchen. Can I give the priestly blessing? That's why many shuls on Simchas Torah, the, the Kohanim give the priestly blessing in Shachris before Kiddush. <laughs> and after Kiddush, we then will be ready to drunk. And, he, and it is absolutely forbidden to have any artificial substance in your body that would try to, uh, in any way, affect your ability to pray. So when you pray, you cannot be drunk, you cannot be on drugs, you cannot be in any way stimulated with artificial substance. You cannot. And who do we learn that from? From Ailey's response. He said, she has been drinking. Well, we hear from her that a drunk person is forbidden to say the feel. Now this is an interesting thing with regard to Purim. Right? If uh, the whether or not it's a bitzvah to get drunk on Purim, that's a question. But if you look at the Shulchan Aruch, they say if you go, if it's going to affect your ability to pray, you're not supposed to get drunk. On if it's going to affect your ability to behave like a mensch, you're not supposed to get drunk. Why did the Shulchan Aruch? The Ramah brings that. So a lot of people want to be extra from on Purim. We're going to get drunk, no matter what. Well, that's not a. <laughs> <laughs> that is not an example of frumkite, you know, being an extra religious. That's an example of stupidity. So, if you drink too much and you cannot concentrate and, and recite the prayers in the proper way, you should not drink. And that goes for Purim too. Absolutely. Now, then we have here. Uh, and Ailey said unto her, how long will you be drunken? And Rabbi Lazar said, from this we learn that one who sees in his neighbor, and if we turn over here, to the back of the, the, the English is in English, something unseemly must reprove him. So if you see something that your neighbor is really not correct, and you know that your neighbor will accept your review, you must reprove him. So, these are some of the laws that we learn here. It's a very important law. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord. So Ula, or some say Rabbi Yosef and Hanina said, she said to him, Now this takes a lot of courage. This is a woman talking to the high priest. You know, if you are right, you are right. No matter what your station is. She is talking to the high priest, the highest religious official of the Jewish religion. And she said to him, Thou art no Lord in this matter. You don't know what you're talking about. Nor does this Holy Spirit rest on you. She tells him that you suspect me of this thing. This proves that you are not a great religious authority. So that took a lot of courage. A lot of guts to stand up to. Him. Some say she said to him, You are no Lord, meaning the Shekhinah and the Holy Spirit is not with you, and that you take the harsher and not the more lenient view of my conduct. So if you don't give me the benefit of the doubt, if you don't give me the benefit of the doubt, then you don't have the divine presence with you. Now that, that's based upon the statement of Pim Have a done kola done the chapsus. Everybody's supposed to judge his neighbor and give that neighbor the benefit of the doubt. Judge that person favorably. And you didn't judge me favorably. You could have interpreted this many, many different ways, but you took the harshest way. You consider me to be drunk. That was another very courageous statement. So then she said, 
Do you not know that I am a woman of sorrowful spirit? I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink. And with love of sin, from this we learn that one who is suspected wrongfully must clear himself. You have the obligation of somebody accuses you of something you did wrong and you know you didn't do it, you have the obligation to stand up and say, no, I didn't do it. That's a tremendous thing. If you did not do anything wrong, you have the right to clear yourself and say, I did not in any way do that thing. So, Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of the I mean, a worthless person. A man who says the tefillah, I mean, Shimon asked me, when drunk, is like one who serves idol. Well, that's a pretty strong statement, too. Mm -hmm. If you daven and you're drunk, it says, with one has served idol. Now, you know, <coughs> in Judaism, we do not forbid drinking of wine, especially at Kiddush, Abdullah. And uh, we, we never really had uh, what we would call prohibition. But usually, traditionally, Jews have had a very low rate of alcoholism. Though the more assimilated they become, the higher the rate. And why is that? Well, it's no question it has to do with uh, religious conduct. Right? Alcohol to us can be used for a a kiddush, a holy thing, but not to be abused, not to be abused. So uh, if a person does abuse it and is constantly in, in a state of inebriation, and that person tries to daven, to pray, it's like serving idols. Serving idols. That's a very strong statement. Right? To say you're like serving idols. This is what it says here. So, you know, the rabbis say, you know, when you drink, uh, they compare it to four different animals. When a person takes one drink, he's mellow like a lamb. Mellow like a lamb. Then he takes two drinks, he's like a lion, he could defeat the whole world. He takes three drinks, he's like a monkey going around like that, making a fool of himself. And he drinks four drinks, he's like a pig vomiting all over himself. So that's why Jews, we've had this inculcated in, into us that it was not a great thing to get drunk. Arky, you have a little drink once in a while, but don't get drunk. Don't get drunk. And here, this is a very strong statement. If you are drunk and you daven, the Shemot Esri is like worshiping idols. Not only is it not a good prayer, it's a negative sin. You're worshiping idols, which is one of the terrible sins, the cardinal sins of Judaism. So, and they prove it from the expression of Belial, which means worthless. Certain sons of God went forth from the midst of thee. Just as there the term is used in connection with idolatry, so here. So they make a connection between what it says about Blial, that she says, don't think I'm a worthless person. And over there it says the pe worthless people went out and worshiped the Bible. So they make a connection. So then Ellie said to her, go in peace. Go in peace. Now Belotha says, from this we learn that one who suspects his neighbor of a fault which he has not committed must beg his part. You have, to ask, you have to apologize. If you suspected somebody doing something bad and they didn't do it, then you must make this part. You must ask for forgiveness. And even more, you must bless him, it says, it says, and the God of Israel grant your petition. So, so Ailey was the high priest, but he knew when he was wrong. He didn't stand on ceremony. He knew he was wrong when he suspected her of being drunk and not of being sincere. And she had the courage to stand up. And so at the end, he says, okay, you're right. You're not only you're right. May God of Israel grant your petition. 
So uh, basically, um, these are the, some of the lessons that the rabbis learned. And, um, and then uh, she continues on. And uh, God does bless her with a child. And who is that child? That child is Shua. And he is dedicated uh, at the age of three or four to the service of God. And the sons of Ailey, and it gives their names here at the beginning of the chapter, the sons of Ailey, so they um, were not worthy of being the, uh, the continuers of the tradition. Chofni and Pinchos. So who took over? Shmuel. And Shmuel, of course, was a very pivotal figure in Jewish life. It was Shmuel who, who at first opposed the crowning of a king over Israel. He felt that uh, God should be our king and we should have no human monarch, only God. And he also was the one who eventually did crown, he anointed two kings, Shaul and David. And uh, he, he was a great, the great spiritual leader of the time. And, the, and his uh, life marked the end of the period of the so-called judges. Now judges mean, in, those, in that context, not a person in court, but a spontaneous leader who could stand up and lead the people when they were in danger. And a judge could come from every group and every gender. There was a, a famous woman judge, Deborah, Deborah. But Ailey marks the end of that, and uh, he marks the beginning of the, of the prophets and of the kings of Israel. So she really uh, prayed for, to God in such a sincere fashion that, uh, that God answered her prayer. God answered, and she had Shmuel, and then what sometimes happens, she had other children too. Other children too. And her prayer is listed also in Shmuel, and because of her prayer, well, that uh, she's considered to be a prophetess. I'll just read it to you here uh, for so that you will know the, the depths of her feelings. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalted in Hashem. My pride was raised to Hashem. <coughs> my mouth opened wide against my antagonist, for I rejoice in your salvation. There is none as holy as Hashem, for there is none beside you, and there is no rock like our God. Now, this is a famous uh, verse. We, it's incorporated in our prayers. Ein kodosh kashem, ki ein biltecha, ve ein sur keilochi. This is a part of our prayers. Now, uh, do not abound in speaking Arrogance upon arrogance. Let not haughtiness come from your mouth. For Hashem is the God of, of all thoughts, and the deeds are counted by Him. She said, that's a basic concept in Judaism. That God knows our thoughts and knows our deeds. And He will help you in your time of need. The bow of the mighty is broken, while the foundering are, are girded with strength. The sated are tired out for bread, while the hungry one cease to be so. While the barren woman bears seven, the one with many children bears becomes the rat. That's it. That's it talks about her. She had seven children. Shmuel, and then six others. Where Penina, who actually at first stopped having children. And then she says, which is a basic concept in Judaism, Hashem brings death and gives life, lowers to the pit and elevates. So what is this? Hashem may mis umechaye. God calls people to die, but also brings them back to life. 
Maureen Shaol, he caused them to go down to the grave. Vayal, but he brings them up again. Hashem, Maureen Shumashir, Mashpil, Af Maureen. God causes people to become poor, but causes people to be rich. He causes people to go down, but causes people to go up. Making me offer dal me ashpos yorim me diyon. Lo shiv im the divin if he says avo yad kilei. Now that's a verse that's very similar to to him. Hallel, right? God raises up from the dust the poor, from the dung heap he will raise up those who are destitute to let make them sit with the princes, and the the throne of glory he will bequeath to them. For the Lord is the foundation of the earth, and he puts upon them the entire world. So these words, these are words of prophecy that she's saying. And the concept that you can never believe in yourself, and the day you die, you don't know if you're going to be up or you're going to be down. But God can, can take you out from the depths Right? He can take you out from the depths and bring you high <coughs> to the heights. Right? And we say also to him a very similar concept that uh, God could take a heaven, a stone that was rejected by the builder and make it into the cornerstone of a great building. Right? So this is, uh, and this is her faith and this is her relief. And because of this, we read it on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. So, if you want to know about women in Judaism, I mean, you don't read it superficially. You know, well, they say, well, the women have to sit in the back or on the top or the inner one. So that shows they're inferior. No, there's nothing to do with it. There are reasons why we have separation of gender during prayer. Has nothing to do with any inferiority of women. Women have the same potential, and Rabbi Shimshon Raphael Hirsch says they have a greater potential for spirituality more than men. That's why women do not have to keep certain commandments, because commandments are there to elevate your soul, but women's soul is already elevated. That's a very famous comment by Rabbi Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, the great German Jewish rabbi of the 19th century. So, uh, one should not look at things superficially. You should look at the depth of the matter. And if you look throughout Jewish history, and throughout the Tanakh, and you look at even uh, throughout our entire 4,000 years of, of uh, existence, one thing you can find is the women of the Jewish people are devoted, faithful to the Jewish religion then the Jewish people will survive. If the women are not devoted to Judaism, are indifferent or apathetic, and even if the men are very devoted, Judaism will not survive. Without a doubt, it's the Jewish mother, right? the Jewish mother, who is the one who will make sure that the Jewish children remain Jewish. So, as we say from Mishra, we say every morning about Shema Beni Musar Ovicha, the Altu Titosh Torah Imecha. Rabbi Salavichik used to quote that all the time. What does that mean? Listen, listen to the, to the discipline of your father, Musar Ovicha. But don't forsake the Torah of your mother. The Torah of your mother. So he said, "Why do you mean your mother, husband is the father is a Musar of Yicha, and this is Torah Simecha, the Torah of your mother?" So he said, "Well, because that's the truth." And he used to say, he said this on many occasions, and it's a part of his written works. But I heard him say it in person. He said, basically, "I learned the laws of Shabbos from my father." But I learned the spirit of Shabbos from my mother. That's what he said. 
they said a very interesting thing, you know, as my wife pointed out the other evening, about the difficulty of, of Pesach, preparing for Pesach. Right? And how some people in this town have people had made to help to make Pesach. And they are the, without that, they might have not made the Pesach directly. But uh, it's interesting, Rabbi Salavich, is that you know, to violate uh, eating chametz on Pesach is a very, very you know, severe punishment. Curries. To eat chametz on Pesach. That's divine excision and divine administered punishment. But I left it always in the hands of my mother and my wife. So if you want to know, did he rely on the, on the goodwill and responsibility of the women? I'm not getting courage because of my wife and my mother. So these are some of the things that we learn from Hannah and we learn from the Jewish religion about uh, how Judaism is to survive. <clears throat> uh, you know, it's amazing today, and with this I will close. Should I close that? What time? Huh? You're up there. Right, okay, within the time limit? Huh? <laughs> You're good. Right, cool so with this I will close. You know, about. Uh, the, um, the tremendous devotion of many, many modern Jewish women. Tremendous devotion. There are women today who will take the entire burden. Now, I'm not saying this is the correct thing to do, but they're willing to do it. They, they are willing to take the entire burden of supporting the family, raising the children, so that their husbands can sit and learn. And where are they doing? In the United States of America. Now, when Moshe Feinstein in 1964 wrote a tshuva, uh, responded to many, he said, well, we have to support the young men studied in, uh, in his kololim because uh, their wives will not support them. That was 1964. You could go to Lakewood, New Jersey, and Brooklyn, New York, and Muncie, New York, and there five towns in New York, in Baltimore and in Chicago, and you will see thousands of women who are taking upon themselves freely and voluntarily that burden. Now, I'm not sure that it's fair, but they're willing to do it. That's amazing. So if Rabbi Moshe Feinstein would be alive today and see what's happening, he would have to change his own children. The whole, the whole responsibility would have to change. Because that's tremendous. Uh, Devotion that these young women show is unbelievable. Uh, I personally feel it might be too much for them. Why well, do they put the burden on them entirely? But they're willing to do it. And when people come for shiduchim, and you know what shiduchim are, some of the women say, I only will marry a man who's going to sit and learn and also boy. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Amazing. Crazy. So in any event, uh, these are some of the things that we learned from Chana. Do you have more here that the Gemara brings that I, I felt that I do not have the time to go into in great depth? But if you want to look at it, you can take the sheet on and uh,